This is book nine in the One-Eyed Giant's Cave. Odysseus, the great teller of tales, launched out on his story. Alcinous majesty shining among your island people. What a fine thing it is to listen to such a bard. As we have here, the man sings like a god. The crown of life, I'd say. There's nothing better than when deep joy holds sway throughout the realm and banqueters up and down the palace sit in ranks, enthralled to hear the bard, and before them all, the tables heaped with bread and meats and drawing wine from a mixing bowl. The steward makes his rounds and keeps the wine cups flowing. This, to my mind, is the best that life can offer. But now you're set on probing the bitter pains I've borne, so I'm to weep and grieve it seems still more. Well then, what shall I go through first? What shall I save for last? What pains the gods have given me my share? Now let me begin by telling you my name, so you may well know it well, and I in times to come, if I can escape the fatal day, will be your host, your sworn friend, though my home is far from here. I am Odysseus, son of Laertes, known to the world for every kind of craft. My fame has reached the skies. Okay, so Odysseus is talking, he's admitting who he is, and he's saying, you guys want to hear my story, and you want to hear all that I've been through since I left Troy, but it's going to be something that I've gone through that's painful. So the first thing that I want you to add to your notes is that the simile, the man sings like a god, um, and that needs to go under figurative language. You also need to know a bard is who would have told the Odyssey. That's who it thought they thought Homer was. They think he was a bard, and that was someone who traveled from town to town and told stories. And they were usually true stories. They would tell them and sing them. Sometimes they were legends, things that were thought to have happened. Sunny Ithaca is my home. Atop her stands our sea mark, Mount Nariton's leafy ridges shimmering in the wind. Around her, a ring of islands circles side by side. Dilichion, same, wooded Zecanthus, too. But mine lies low and away, the farthest out to sea, rearing in the, to the western dusk, while the others face the east in breaking day. Mine is a rugged land, but good for raising sons, and I myself know no sweeter sight on earth than a man's own native country. True enough, clips of the lustrous goddess tried to hold me back, deep in her arching caverns, craving me for a husband. So did Circe, holding me just as warmly in her halls, the bewitching queen of Aea, keen to have me too, but they never won the heart inside me, never. So nothing is as sweet as a man's own country. His own parents, even though he settled down in some luxurious house, off in a foreign land, and far from those who bore him. So he's starting to tell a little bit of his story, where he's from. He says that Calypso, where our story with Odysseus starts when he's on Calypso's island. And he's thinking back of what has happened. So you have to remember between the Iliad, which was the first book, and we didn't read that, and the Odyssey, there's ten years that passed. So Odysseus was missing for 10 years. He left home, was in Troy for 10 years at that battle, and then for 10 years he's been missing. So he was shipwrecked on Calypso's Island, but he was also going through all these different trials, and that's what he's referring to. So he was with Calypso. He says, I was also with Circe. And then he said, but these women wanted to keep me as their husband, but I wanted to get home to my wife. No more. Come. Let me tell you about the voyage fraught with hardship. Zeus inflicted on me, homeward bound from Troy. So I want to pause here and just let you know. What's about to happen is Odysseus is going to tell his story. What happened up until this point. So he's going to tell us everything he's been through. So what is happening is we're looking back. And this is called a flashback. So Odysseus is remembering and he's telling the story. So I don't want you to get confused and think this is happening. He is still in Phaeacia. He is still talking to King Alcinous. He's explaining his story to these people. So this is not new information. All right, let's keep going. The wind drove me out of Ilium on to Ismeris, the Sicenese stronghold. There I sacked the city, killed the men. But as for the wives and plunder, that rich hall we dragged away from the place. We shared it round so no one, not on my account, would go deprived of his fair share of spoils. Then I urged them to cut and run, set sail. But would they listen? Not those mutinous fools. There was too much wine to swill, too many sheep to slaughter down along the beach, and shambling longhorn cattle. Um, I want to pause here. So when he's talking about sacking the city, that means what they would do, and this was what everyone did. When you came to a city and you conquered it, so you battled them, you would destroy the city, just like they did to Troy. You would kill the men, and you would take the women to have children with, or as slaves, and you would take plunder, which is going to be any kind of treasure. So that was a very common thing. This was not viewed as wrong. They didn't do anything wrong. This is what you did. And so he says that they did. And when he's saying them, I urge them, he's talking about all the soldiers who are with him. 
So when he went to Troy, Odysseus took men with him from Ithaca. So these are his men that are coming back with him. So these men he was trying to get to leave, but they insisted on basically having a party on the beach is what's essentially happening. And all the while, the Sicinese sought out other Sicinese, called for help from their neighbors living inland, a larger force and stronger soldiers too, skilled hands at fighting men from chariots, skilled when a crisis broke to fight on foot. Out of the morning mist they came against us, packed as the leaves and spears that flower forth in spring. And Zeus presented us with a disaster, me and my comrades, doomed to suffer blow on mortal blow. Lining up, both armies battled it out against our swift ships, both ranked each, ranked each other with hurtling bronze lances. So, those who did su survive went and got their buddies and came and fought Odysseus and his men and killed a lot of them. You do have a simile I want you to add to figurative language. Um, and it is packed as the leaves and spears that flower forth in the spring. So that's a simile. Um, and this is a, these are, you're going to add a lot to events in this chapter. This is an event I want you to add. So when they fought the Sicinese, this is an event. So they fought them, they killed their men, destroyed the city. Then the men who survived went and got their buddies, came back, and they killed, they attacked and killed a lot of Odysseus men, basically in defense. So that is an important event. Long as morning rose, and the blessed day grew stronger, we stood and fought them off, massed as they were. But then when the sun wheeled past the hour for unyoking oxen, the Sicinese broke out, broke our lines and beat us down at last. Out of each ship, six men at arms were killed. The rest of us rode away from certain doom. From there we sailed on, glad to escape our death, yet sick at heart for the dear companions we had lost. So they took off. They were out of there. And they left and they were upset because of the people who died. But I would not let our rolling ships set sail until the crews had raised the triple cry, saluting each poor comrade, cut down by the fierce Sicinese on that plain. Now Zeus, who masked the storm clouds, hit the fleet with the north wind, a howling demonic gale shrouding over in thunderheads, the earth and sea at once, and night swept down from the sky, and the ships went plunging headlong on, our sails splashed to rags by the hurricane's blast. We struck them, cringing at death, we rode our ships to the nearest shoreline, pulled with all our power. There for two nights, two days, we lay by, no let up, eating our hearts out, bent with pain and bone tired. When dawn with her lovely locks brought on the third day, then stepping the masts and hoisting the white sails high, we long lounged at the oarlocks, letting wind and helmsmen keep us true on course. And now at long last, I might have reached my native land unscathed. But just as I doubled Malia's cape and a tide ripped and the north wind drove me way off course, careering past Cythera. Nine whole days I was borne along by rough, deadly winds on the fish-infested sea. Then on the tenth, our squadron reached the land of the lotus eaters, people who eat the lotus, mellow fruit, and flower. We disembarked on the coast, drew water there, and crewmen snatched a meal by the swift ships. Okay, so this is event number two. Zeus sent a huge storm, and the storm caused them to get off course. So any kind of sailor knows to use the stars to get home in the direction they were going they would use compasses they would use all these different things to get home this huge storm came in got them confused blew them way off course so that's your event number two and then at the very end of this page we start event number three these should all be in your important events event number three land of the lotus eaters once we'd had our fill of food and drink i sent a detail ahead two picked men and a third a runner to scout out who might live there. Men like us, perhaps, who live on bread? So off they went, and soon enough they mingled among the natives, lotus eaters. Lotus eaters who had no notion of killing my companions. Not at all. They simply gave them the lotus to taste instead. Any crewman who ate the lotus, the honey-sweet fruit, lost all desire to send a message back, much less return. Their only wish to linger there with the lotus eaters, grazing on lotus. All memory of the journey home dissolved forever. But I brought them back, back to the hollow ships and streaming tears. I forced them, hauled them under the rowing benches, lashed them fast, and shouted out commands to my other steady comrades. Quick, no time to lose, embark in the racing ships, so none could eat the lotus. Forget the voyage home. They swung aboard at once. They stacked the oars on ranks, and in rhythm churned the water white with stroke on stroke. Okay, so lotus flower. If you ever watched Percy Jackson, the very first Percy Jackson movie, the kids eat, they're in a casino type place, and they eat this this cookie looking thing, and it's lotus flower, and they lose all track of time, and they're, they're having a great time, and they forget what they're doing and why they need to go away. And there will be a clip on Google Classroom of that scene, so you can see kind of a comparison. 
it's obviously a modern day comparison, but it's the same concept. Whenever some of the men, and not all of them, but some of the men ate this fruit, it caused them to not want to go home, to not go back to the ship and tell them what's happened. So they just want to stay there. So Odysseus literally drug them back to the ship. And it was like they were drugged because they were crying, didn't want to leave, very upset, almost acting like children. And they had to actually be tied to the ship. So this is what you're going to explain in the event for the, the lotus eaters. So that was your event number three. From there we sailed on, our spirits now at low ebb, and reached the land of the high and mighty Cyclops, lawless brutes who trust so to the everlasting gods. They never plant with their own hands or plow the soil. Unsown, unplowed, the earth teems with all they need, wheat, barley, and vines, swelled by the rains of Zeus, tealed a, full, a big, full-bodied wine from the clustered grapes. This is event number three, land of the cy high and mighty Cyclops. This is where we're going to go to event number, th or number four, I'm sorry, event number four with the Cyclops. They have no meeting place for counsel, no laws either. No, upon the mountain peaks they live in arching caverns, each a law to himself, ruling his wives and children, not a care in the world for any neighbor. Now a level island stretches flat across the harbor, not close in shore to the Cyclops' coast, not too far out, thick with woods where the wild goats breed by hundreds. No trampling of men to start them from their lairs, no hun hunters roughing it out in the woody ridges, stalking quarry ever raid their heaven. No flocks browse, no plowlands roll with wheat. Unplowed, unsown forever, empty of humankind, the island just feeds droves of bleeding goats. Alrighty, so we're about to go to the Cyclops Island. This is my favorite part of the Odyssey. And they talk about how the Cyclops doesn't grow anything. They don't do anything except for they herd goats. And they eat basically what the land produces. So they don't plant anything, they don't take care of anything, it's just whatever naturally grows there. The Cyclops have no ships of crimson prowls, no shipwrights there to build them good trim craft that could sail them out to foreign ports of call as most men risk the seas to trade with other men. Such artisans would have made this island too a decent place to live in. No mean spot it could bear you any crop you like in season. The water meadows along the low foaming shore run soft and moist and your vines would never flag. The land's clear for plowing, harvest on harvest a man could reap a healthy st stand of grain. The subsoil is dark and rich. There's a snug deep water harbor there. What's more, no need for mooring gear, no anchor stones to heave, no cables to make fast. Just beach your keels right out on the days your, till your shipmate's spirit stirs for open sea and a fair wind blows. And at last, the, at the harbor's head, there's a spring that rushes fresh from beneath a cave, and black poplars flourish around its mouth. Well, here we landed, and surely a god steered us in through pit, the pitch black night. So it's a beautiful island. The land is perfect for planting crops. It's perfect if you have ships because there's not going to be a ton of rocks that you're going to shipwreck on. You're going to hurt your ships. Um, it's perfect, but there's nothing planted there. There's nothing used because there's no people that live there. It's the land of the Cyclops. So this is where your, story, your event four is about to start. All Odysseus has been doing is describing what the island looked like. And he's, again, looking back and telling him what's happened. So, this is where event four starts, and I want you to summarize the event of the Cyclops. And this is a longer one, so I want you to be prepared for that. It is a little bit longer, but you're going to summarize that in your important events. But it's just where it's the land of the Cyclops, and that's what you can call this event. Not that he ever showed himself with thick fog swirling around the ships, the moon wrapped in clouds, and not a glimmer stealing through the gloom. Not one of us glimpsed the island, scanning hard, or the long combers rolling us slowly toward the coast. Not till our ships had run their keels ashore. Bewitching our vessel smoothly, striking sail, the crew swung out on the low shelving sand, and there we fell asleep, waiting, awaiting dawn's first light. I want you to pause here and add a figurative language, some more alliteration. Striking sail and shelving sand. That is alliteration. When young dawn with her rose-red fingers shone once more, we all turned out, intrigued to tour the island. So they've landed on the island, and they're about to go figure out where they are. Like, we're going to go walk around. They did not know they were on the land of the Cyclops. It's foggy there, and they cannot tell. The local nymphs, the daughters of Zeus himself, flushed mountain goats so the crews could make their meal. Quickly, we fetched our curved bows and hunting spears from the ships. And, splitting up into three bands, we started shooting. And soon enough, some god had sent us bags of game to warm our hearts. A dozen vessels sailed to my command, and to each crew nine goats were shared out, and mine alone took ten. Then all day long, till the sun went down, we sat and feasted well on sides of meat and rounds of heavy wine. Okay, 
So they found these goats, and they're like, oh, it's a gift from the gods. And they went out, and they hunted these goats. They killed them, and they sat, and they cooked them, and that's what they ate. And they just sat there and ate all day and drank this strong wine. The good red rock in our vessel's holds had not run out. There was still plenty left. The men had carried off a generous store in jars when we stormed and sacked the Sicenes holy city. Um, they're talking about wine. Now we stared across the Cyclops shore so near we could even see their smoke, hear their voices, their bleeding sheep and goats. And, when the, and then when the sun had set and night came on, we lay down and slept at the water's shelving edge. When young Dawn with her rose red fingers shone once more, I called and muster briskly, commanding all the hands. The rest of you stay here, my friend in arms. I'll go across with my own ship and crew and probe the natives living over there. What are they, violent, savage, lawless, or friendly to strangers, God-fearing men? With that, I boarded ship and told the crew to embark at once and cast off cables quickly. They swung aboard and they sat to the oars in ranks and rhythm churned the water white with stroke on stroke. Okay, so they know that there's people living there on this land. They don't know that it's Cyclops. So they're going over there to check out what, what's happening there if there's people there. But as soon as we reached the coast, I mentioned, no long trip. We spied a cavern just at the shore, gaping above the surf, towering, overgrown with laurel. And here, big flocks, sheep, and goats were stalled to spend the night. And around its mouth, a yard was walled up, with quarried boulders sunk deep in earth, and enormous pines and oak trees looming darkly. So there's a giant cave, and they see that all the flocks, all the sheep and goats, sleep there at night. Here was a giant slayer, in fact, who always pastured his sheep flocks, a far field never mixed with the others. A grim loner, dead set in his own lawless ways, here was a piece of work by God, a monster built like no mortal who ever supped on bread. No, like a shaggy peak, I'd say, a man mountain, roaring head and shoulders over the world. Now that I told most of my good trusty crew to wait, to sit tight by the ship and guard her well while I picked out my dozen finest fighters and off I went. But I took a skin of wine along, the ruddy irresistible wine that Maron gave me once, Euthanes' son, a priest of Apollo, lord of Ismaris, because we'd rescued him, his wife and children, reverent as we were. He lived, you see, in Apollo's holy grove. Okay, so he took, Odysseus took his twelve best men to go and explore, and they saw this giant man, and they, they go to explore, but before they leave, they take some wine. He says he got it from this guy who was a priest of Apollo because he had saved this guy's wife and children. He gave Odysseus this really great wine. And so in return, he gave me splendid gifts. He handed me seven bars of well wrought gold, a mixing bowl of solid silver, then this wine. He drew it off in generous wine jars, twelve in all, and all unmixed, and such a bouquet a drink fit for the gods. No man or, maid or man of his household knew that, that secret store, only himself, his loving wife, and a single servant. Whenever they'd drink the deep red mellow vintage, twenty cups of water he'd stir in one of wine. And what an aroma wafted from the bowl. What magic, what a godsend. No joy in holding back when that was poured. Alright, so this wine is super, super strong. He would stir it in with twenty cups of water because it was so strong. This is important and you'll see why. And I actually want you to write down here, this is foreshadowing. And I want you to put this in your figurative language. It is a description of how strong this wine is, and it's going to be important coming up. So I want you to put this down in foreshadowing, and you don't have to write all the lines. Just explain it. Filling a great goat skin now, I took this wine, provisions too, in the leather sack. A sudden foreboding told my riding spirit I'd soon come up against some giant clad in power, like an armor plate, a savage deaf to justice, blind to law. This is a second example of foreshadowing. He had a bad feeling. A sudden foreboding, it means a sudden bad feeling. So he has a feeling something bad's going to happen. Our party quickly made its way to this cave, but we failed to find our host himself inside. He was off in his pasture ranging his sleek flocks. So they get to the cave, but the guy who lives in the cave isn't there right now. He's with his flocks. So we explored his den, gazing wide-eyed at it all. The large flat rocks loaded with drying cheeses, the folds crowded with young lambs and kids, split into three groups. Here the spring-born, here mid-yearlings, here the fresh sucklings. Off to the side, each sort was pinned apart. So they're describing the different ages of lambs and goats, is what they're doing, and how they were all separated. And all his vessels, pails and hammered buckets, he used for milking, were brimmed full with whey. From the start, my comrades pressed me, pleading hard, let's make away with the cheeses and then come back. Hurry, drive the lambs and kids from the pens to our swift ship, put out to sea at once. 
So the men, Odysseus' men, want to take the whey, which is like cheeses from milking. It's, they milk the goats, and they make they have milk from them, and then cheeses and that stuff. The men wanted to take the goats, the lambs and kids, so the young sheep and then the young goats, and they wanted to steal them. But Odysseus said, no, but I would not give way. And how much better it would have been. Not till I saw him what gifts he'd give. But he proved no lovely sight to my companions. There we built a fire, set our hands on the cheeses, offered some to the gods, and ate the bulk ourselves, and settled down inside awaiting his return. And back he came from pasture late in the day, herding his flocks home, and lugging a huge load of good dry logs to fuel his fire at supper. So instead of stealing this stuff, they stay in this guy's cave, the Cyclops cave, and eat his cheese, and they sacrifice some to the gods. And Odysseus is like, we should have done that because... We thought, it, I thought it'd be better to wait for him and talk to him, but turns out not so much. He flung them down in the cave, a jolting crash. We scuttled in panic into the deepest dark recess. And next he drove his sleek flocks into the open vault, and all he'd milk, all he'd milk at least. But he left the males outside, rams and billy go goats out in the high walled yard. Then to close the door, he hoisted overhead a tremendous, massive slab. No 22 wagons, rugged and four-wheeled, could budge that boulder off the ground, I tell you. Such an immense stone the monster wedged to block his cave. So, um, you actually have a metaphor here. They're comparing the Cyclops to a monster. So they're calling him a monster, but it's comparing him to one. So it's a metaphor for your figurative language. Then down he squatted to milk his sheep and bleeding goats, each in order, and put a suckling underneath each dam. And half of the fresh white milk he curdled quickly and set it aside in wicker racks to press for cheese. The other half let stand in pails and buckets, ready at hand to wash his supper down. As soon as he'd briskly finished all his chores, he lit his fire and spied us in the blaze. And strangers, he thundered out, now, who are you? Where did you sail from? Over the running sea lanes? Out on a trading spree or roving the waves like pirates, sea wolves raiding all, all at will, who risk their lives to plunder other men? I want you to write down that simile at the very, very top. Roving the waves like pirates. Our hearts inside us shook, terrified by his rumbling voice and monstrous hulk. Nevertheless, I found the nerve to answer firmly. Men of Achaea we are, and bound now from Troy, driven far off course by the warring winds, and over the vast gulf of the sea, battling home on a strange tack, a route that's off the map. And so we've come to you, so it must please King Zeus's plotting heart. You have another example of alliteration there. Warring winds. Add that to your notes. We're glad to say we're men of a tribe Agamemnon, whose fame is the proudest thing on earth these days. So great a city he sacked. Such multitudes he killed. But since we've ch chanced on you, we're at your knees. In hopes of a warm welcome, even a guest gift, the sort that hosts give strangers. That's the custom. Respect the gods, my friend. We're suppliants at your mercy. Zeus of strangers guard all guests and suppliants. Strangers are sacred. Zeus will avenge their rights. So he's saying, you should help us. We're at your mercy. We're going to respect the gods, and we want you to help us. We were kind of sit here. We got lost. So help us. Stranger, he grumbled back from his brutal heart. You must be a fool, stranger, or come from nowhere, telling me to fear the gods or avoid their wrath. We Cyclops never blink at Zeus and Zeus's shield of storm and thunder, or any other blessed god. We've got more force by far. I'd never spare you in fear of Zeus's hatred. You were your comrades here, unless I had the urge. But tell me, where did you moor your sturdy ship when you arrived? Up the coast or close in? I'd just like to know. So he laid his trap, but he never caught me. No, wise to the word. I shot back in my crafty way. My ship, Poseidon God of the Earthquake, smashed my ship. He drove it against the rocks at your island's fair cape. Dashed it off a cliff as the winds rode us in. I and the men you see escaped a sudden death. Not a word in reply to that, the ruthless brute. Okay, so Cyclops wanted to know where the ship was, and he's thinking, I want to go find that ship. And Odysseus is like, no, no, we don't have a ship, because they don't want the Cyclops going and finding their other men. Lurching up, he lunged out with his hands toward my men, and snatching two at once, wrapping them on the ground, he knocked them dead like pups. Their brains gushed out all over, soaked the floor, and ripping them limb from limb to fix his meal, he bolted them down like a mountain lion, left no scrap, devoured entrails, flesh and bones, marrow and all. So now that the Cyclops thinks that there is no one to come save them because there's no ship, he kills them and eats them. You have two similes here. Dead like pups, bolted them down like a, mount like a mountain lion. Write both those down, similes, in your figurative language notes. 
We flung our arms to Zeus. We wept and cried aloud, looking on at his grisly work, paralyzed, appalled. But once the Cyclops had stuffed his enormous gut with human flesh, washing it down with raw milk, he slept in his cave stretched out along his flocks. And I, with my fighting heart, I thought at first to steal up to him, draw the sharp sword at my hip, and stab his chest where the midriff packs the liver. I groped for the fatal spot, but a fresh thought held me back. There at a stroke we finished off ourselves as well. How could we with our bare hands heave back that slab he set to block the cavern's graping maw? So we lay there groaning, waiting Don's first life. So they're stuck there. They need this Cyclops to move the big giant boulder off from the doorway. If they kill the Cyclops, they're going to die of starvation because they're going to be trapped in this cave. When young Don with her rose red fingers shone once more, the monster relit his fire and milked his handsome ewes. Each in order, putting a suckling underneath each dam, and as soon as he'd briskly finished all his chores, he snatched up two more men and fixed his meal. Well fed, he drove his fat sheep away from, from the cave, lightly lifting the huge door slab up and away, then slipped it back in place, as a hunter flips the lid of his quiver shut. I want you to go ahead and write down lift, lightly lifting as alliteration. There's a lot in here, and we're not writing every one of them down, and I want you to be aware of that, so if you see others... There are a lot that we're not writing down. I just want you to write down some of them so you are practicing knowing what alliteration is. Um, when it says putting a suckling underneath each dam, it's putting babies underneath mothers. So it's not necessarily a baby sheep with the mom sheep, but it's a, ba a baby sheep with a mother sheep so they can nurse. That's what it's meaning. Um, let's see. And then you know, also you have a simile. Slipped it back in place as a hunter flips the lid of his quiver shut. That's a simile. I want you to add that. Piercing whistles, turning his flock to the hills, he left me there, the heart inside me brooding on revenge. How could I pay him back? Would Athena give me glory? Here was the plan that struck my mind as best. The Cyclops' great club, there it lay by the pins, olive wood full of sap. He lopped it off to brandish it once dry. Looking it over, we judged it to be it big enough to be the mast of a pitch-black ship with our twenty oars, a freighter broad in the beam that plows through miles of sea, so long, so thick, it bulked before our eyes. So this is a massive club. It's big enough to be the mass of a ship. It's huge. Well, blinking it now, I chopped off a fathom's link, pushed it to comrades, told them to plane it down, and they made the club smooth as I bent and shaved the tip to a stabbing point. So they took this and they made it sharp at the end, like a sharp point. I turned it over, the blazing fire to chart good and hard, then hit it well, buried deep under the dung that littered the cavern's, cavern's floor in, the, in thick, wet clumps. If you don't know what dung is, it's poop. So they buried it underneath a bunch of poop because you have a whole bunch of sheep and goats living in this cave every night. Think about the amount of poop. It's a lot. And now I ordered my shipmates, all the cast lots, who'd brave it out with me, to hoist our stake and grind it into his eye when sleep had overcome him. Luck of the draw, I got the very ones I would have picked myself. Four good men and I in the lead made five. Nightfall brought him back, herding his woolly sheep, and he quickly drove the sleek flock into the vaulted cavern. Rams and all, none left outside in the walled yard. His own idea, perhaps, or a god led him on. So this time, all the sheep and goats come in the cave. They, he, the Cyclops did not leave any of the males outside. Um, whenever it's talking about they're going to take this giant stake, so it's a super long, super thick pole, and they're going to stab, and it's very pointed on the end, they're going to stab him in the eye. A cyclops, remember, has one eye. And if you didn't know that, a cyclops has one eye. And his eye would have been giant. So he's going to really big to stab him in the eye with. Kill him. Or at least blind him to get away. Which is going to be their plan to get away. Then he hoisted the huge slab to block the door and squatted to milk his sheep and bleeding goats. Each in order, putting a suckling underneath each dam. And soon as he'd briskly finished all his chores... He snatched up two more men and fixed his meal. But this time I lifted a carved wooden bowl, brimful of my ruddy wine, and went right up to the Cyclops, enticing. Here, Cyclops, try this wine to top off the banquet of human flesh you bolted down. Judge for yourself what stock our ship had stored. I brought it here to make you a fine libation, hoping you would pity me, Cyclops, send me home. But your rages are insufferable. You barbarian. How can any man on earth come visit you after this? What you've done outrages all that's right. At that, he seized the bowl and tossed it off, and the Hikiti wine pleased him immensely. More, he demanded a second bowl, a hearty helping. And tell me your name now, quickly, so I can hand my guest a gift to warm his heart. So Odysseus is like, obviously there's nothing we can do with you, so you might as well take our wine. Remember we talked about, this wine was 
so strong that when the man who gave it to them drank it, he added 20 cups of water to it, which is a lot. So even though this man is, is a giant, is a giant cyclops, it would still be enough to affect him. Our soil yields the cyclops powerful, full-bodied wine, and the rains from Zeus build its strength. But this, this is nectar ambrosia that flows from heaven. So it's not really ambrosia. They're just comparing it. And this is a metaphor. And right there, any figure of language, they're comparing wine to nectar and ambrosia. Because they're saying it's so good, it's like food of the gods. So he declared, I poured him another fiery bowl. Three bowls I brimmed, and three he drank to the last drop, the fool. And then when the wine was swirling around his brain, I approached my host with a cordial winning word. So you asked me the name I'm known by, Cyclops. I will tell you. But you must give me a guest gift, as you promised. Nobody. That's my name. Nobody. So my mother and father call me. All my friends. But he boomed back at me from his ruthless heart. Nobody. I'll eat nobody last of all his friends. I'll eat the others first. That's my gift to you. With that, he toppled over, sprawled full length, flat on his back, and lay there. His massive neck slumped to one side. And sleep that conquers all overwhelmed him now. As wine came spurting flooding up from his gullet with chunks of human flesh, he vomited blind drunk. Okay, so the Cyclops is drunk, and now he's puking. But he asked Odysseus his name, and Odysseus, remember, is very wise. And this is a great, this specific event is a great example of this. Odysseus says that his name is nobody. So the Cyclops says, okay, well, I'll eat nobody last. And this is a great example of irony. So put that in your notes. Um, irony, I'll eat nobody last. That's going to be your example of verbal irony there. You can just put that under under your figure of language and make sure you include that. And this is very ironic, so Odysseus is doing this on purpose. And you'll kind of see why. Now at last I thrust our stake in a bed of embers to get it red hot and rallied all my comrades. Courage, no panic, no one hang back now. And green as it was, just as the olive stake was about to catch fire, the glow terrific, yes. I dragged it from the flames so I'm in clustering round as some god breathed enormous courage as some god breathed enormous courage through us all. This st is such a heavy stake because it's so big it takes all of them to lift it and carry it. So it's very big and heavy. Hoisting high that olive stake with its stabbing point straight into the monster's eye they rammed it hard. I drove my weight on it from above and bored it home as a shipwright bores his beam with a shipwright's drill. That men below, whipping the strap back and forth, whirl, and the drill keeps twisting faster, never stopping. Okay, this is a extended simile, and I want you to write it down. Extended simile, because it's a continuous comparison. They are comparing st stabbing this giant stake into the Cyclops' eye. They're comparing it to how a shipwright would build the shipwright, and how they would drill the beam of a ship and so I want you to compare it to that so they're comparing the stake and putting it into the cyclops eye to a shipwright boring his, it says how a shipwright bores his beam and it continues that comparison as someone on a ship building a ship so we seized our stake with its fiery tip and bored it round and round in the giant's eye till blood came boiling up around that smoking shaft and the hot blast singed his brow and eyelids around the core and the broiling eyeball burst, its crackling roots blazed and hissed as the blacksmith plunges it a glowing axe or adds in an ice cold bath and the metal screeches steam, its temper hardens. That's the iron streak. So the eye of the cyclops sizzled round that stake. This is another extended simile. It is comparing the sound of the eyeball bursting, just like as the sound um, a glowing axe makes when a blacksmith puts it in water. He loosed the, a hideous roar. The rock walls echoed round and we scuttled back in terror. The monster wrenched the spike from his eye and it came out with a red geyser of blood. He flung it aside with a frantic hands and mad with pain, he bellowed out for help from his neighbor Cyclops, living round about in caves on a windswept crags. Hearing his cries, they lumbered up from every side and hulking round his cavern, asked what ailed him. What, Polyphemus? What in the world's the trouble? Roaring out in the god-sent night to rob us of our sleep. So the Cyclops name is Polyphemus. So other Cyclops heard Polyphemus, who was the Cyclops inside the cave, screaming. And they all came to see what was going on. Like, Polyphemus, what's wrong? So you should have them carry your characterization chart from the very, very beginning. Because they reference this, like page one, book one. 
but the Cyclops' name is Polyphemus. And you can add what we know about him. He's evil. He has sheep. Those are all character traits. He's killing humans. We know he's not a very nice person. Cyclops. Surely no one's wrestling your flocks against your will. Surely no one's trying to kill you now by fraud or force. And this is the Cyclops outside saying this. Like, surely you're okay. Nobody, friends, Polyphemus fell back from his cave. Nobody's killing me now by fraud and not by force. If you're alone, his friends boom back at once, and nobody's trying to overpower you now, look, it must be a plague sent here by mighty Zeus. And there's no escape from that. You better pray to your father, Lord Poseidon. So remember, he is the son of Poseidon. Poseidon made the Cyclops. Okay, so Polyphemus is saying that nobody is doing this because he thinks Odysseus' name is nobody. But everybody outside the cave is like, well, if nobody's in there and nobody is bothering you, what's your problem? Because they think he's saying there's nobody there. But he's like, no, nobody, nobody's doing this. So you can see the play on words, which is all verbal irony. And this is Odysseus's plan. They lumbered off, but laughter filled my heart to think how nobody's name, my great cunning stroke, had duped them one and all. But the Cyclops there, still groaning, racked with agony, groped around for the huge slab and heaving it from the doorway, down he sat in the cave's mouth, his arms spread wide, hoping to catch a comrade stealing out with sheep. Such a blithing fool he took me for, but I was already plotting what was the best way out. How could I find escape from death for my crew, myself as well? So Cyclops is trying to catch them. He opens up the, the cave door, the big, huge boulder he has there, and he's reaching out trying to catch them as they escape with the sheep. But Odysseus has a plan. My wits kept weaving, weaving cunning schemes, Life at stake, monstrous death staring us in the face, till this plan struck my mind as best. That flock, those well-fed rams with their splendid thick fleece, sturdy, handsome beasts sporting their dark weight of wool. I lashed them abreast, quietly, twisting the willow twigs the cyclops slept on. Giant lawless brute. I took them three by three. Each ram in the middle bore a man, while the two rams on either side would shield him well. So three beasts bear a man, each man, but as for myself... There was one bellwether ram, the prize of all the flock, and clutching him by his back, tucked up under his shaggy belly, there I hung, face upward, both hands locked in his marvelous deep fleece, so clinging for dear life, my spirit steeled, enduring. Okay, so they went, um, each man took three rams and kind of tied himself to it and hid either beside or underneath them. So they were thick enough that when the cyclops reached out to touch them, he would just feel the fleece. And then Odysseus took the biggest one, like this giant ram, giant goat, and went underneath it and held on to the fleece underneath, like from its belly. So they would, so the Cyclops Polyphemus would only feel the fleece. So we held on, desperate, waiting Dawn's first light. As soon as young Dawn with her rose red fingers shone once more, the rams went rumbling out of the cave toward pasture. The ewes kept bleeding round their pins, unmilked, their udders about to burst. Their master now, heaving in torment, fell the back, fell the back of each animal. Halting before him here, but the idiot never sensed my men were trussed up under their thick fleecy ribs. So all the men are tied up, they tied themselves up under the, um, under the goats and their bellies, like underneath them. And last of them all came my great ram now striding out, weighed down with his dense wool and my deep plots. Stroking him gently, powerful Polyphemus muttered, Dear old ram, why last of the flock to quit the cave? In the good old days, you'd never lag behind the rest. You, with your long marching strides, first by far of the flock to graze the fresh young grasses, first by far to reach the rippling streams, first to turn back home, keen for your fold, when night comes on. But now you're last of all. And why? Sick at heart for your master's eye, that coward gouged out with his wicked crew, only after he'd stunned my wits with wine. That, that nobody, who's not escaped his death, I swear not yet. Oh, if only you thought like me, had words like me, to tell me where that scoundrel is cringing from my rage. I'd smash him against the ground. I'd spill his brains flooding across my cave. And that would ease my pain, of my heart, of the pains that good for nothing nobody made me suffer. And with that the threat, let he let my, and with that threat he let my ram go free outside. But as soon as we'd got one foot past cave and courtyard, first I loosed myself from the ram, then loosed my men. Then quickly glancing back again and again, we drove our flock, good plump beasts with their long sharks, straight to the ship. And a welcome sight we were to loyal comrades, we who'd escaped our deaths. But for all the rest, they broke down and wailed. I cut it short. I stopped each shipmate's cries, my head tossing, brows frowning, silent signals to hurry. Tumble our fleecy herd on board, launch out to open sea. So the men are upset because they're like, we, some of, some, some of them died. And they're upset that their men are gone. Their friends are gone. 
but they're getting all the sheep on board. And Odysseus is trying to tell them to be quiet. We've got to get out of here and get out of here fast. Because there are other cyclops. They swung aboard. They sat on the, to the oars on rank. And in rhythm turned the water white with stroke on stroke. But once offshore, as far as a man's shout can carry, I call back to the cyclops' stinging taunts. So, cyclops, not no weak coward it was, whose crew you bent to devour there in your vaulted cave, you with your brute force. Your filthy crimes came down on your own head, you shameless cannibal, daring to eat your guests in your own house. So Zeus and the other gods have paid you back. That made the rage of the monster boil over. Ripping off the peak of a towering crag, he heaved it so hard, the boulder landed just in front of our dark prow, and a huge swell reared up as the rock went plunging under, a tidal wave from the open sea. The sudden backwash drove us landward again, forcing us close inshore, but grabbing a long pole, I thrust it off and away. Tossing my head for dear life, signaling crews to put their backs on the oars, escape the grim death. They threw themselves in the labor, rode on fast, and but once we'd plowed the breakers twice as far, again I began to taunt the cyclops, men around me trying to check me, calm me, left and right. So headstrong, why? Why rile the beast again? That rocky flung in the sea just now, hurling our ship to shore once more. We thought we'd die on the spot. If he caught us down from one of us, just a whisper, he would have crushed our heads in ship timbers with one heave of another flashing jagged rock. So Polyphemus ripped off a rock from the mountain and threw it at them, and it almost hit their ship, and then it was such a big piece of rock, and it hit the water so hard, it actually caused a giant, caused a giant wave that pushed them back toward the shore. So it almost caused them to get up on the shore and get stuck again. Good God, the brute can throw. So they begged, but they could not bring my fighting spirit around. I called back with another burst of anger. Cyclops! If any man on the face of the earth should ask you who blinded you, Shamed you so, say Odysseus, raider of cities, he gouged out your eye, Laertes' son, who makes his home in Ithaca. So I vaunted, he groaned back in answer, Oh, no, no, that prophecy years ago, it all comes home to me with a vengeance now. We once had a prophet here, a great tall man, Telemus, Eurymus' son, a master at reading signs, who grew old in his trade among his fellow cyclops. All this, he warned me, would come to pass some day, that I be blinded here at the hands of one Odysseus. But I always looked for a handsome giant man to cross my path, some fighter clad in power-like armor plate. But now, look what a dwarf, a spineless good-for-nothing, stuns me with wine and gouges out my eye. Come here, Odysseus, let me give you a guest gift, and urge Poseidon the earthquake god to speed you home. So, um, Odysseus won't stop taunting. He keeps mouthing off at Polyphemus, and his men are like, please stop, let's just get out of here. But he keeps going, and he tells the Cyclops, so Odysseus, and the Cyclops is like, there was a prophecy and it was told years ago that something like this would happen and so it has happened and he's like you're not even that great you're a wimp i can't believe it was you who did this to me i am his son and he claims to be my father true and he himself will heal me if he pleases no other blessed god no man can do the work so he's saying poseidon will help me because he's my father that's what polyphemus is saying to odysseus heal you here was my parting shot would to God I could strip you of life and breath and ship you down to the house of death as surely as no one will ever heal your eye, not even your earthquake God himself. But at that he bellowed out to Lord Poseidon, thrusting his arms to the starry skies and prayed, Hear me, Poseidon, God of the sea blue main who rocks the earth. If I really am your son and you claim to be my father, come, grant that Odysseus, raider of cities, Laertes' son who makes his home in Ithaca, never reaches home. Or if he's fated to see his people once again and reach his well-built house in his own native country, let him come home late and come a broken man, all shipmates lost, alone in a stranger's ship, and let him find a world of pain at home. So Polyphemus says, let him never get home, Poseidon, and let him just be forever away from his home and never make it back, or let it make, him take, make it take him a super long time to get home and make it be miserable when he gets home, make there be something bad there. So he prayed, and the god of the sea blue main, Poseidon, heard his prayer. The monster suddenly hoisted a boulder, far larger, wheeled, and heaved it, putting his weight behind it. Massive strength, and the boulder crashed, crashed close, landing just in the wake of our dark stern, just failing to graze the rudder's bladed edge. A huge swell re reared up as the rock went plunging under, yes, and the tidal breaker drove us out to our island's far shore, where all my well-decked ships lay moored, clustered, waiting, and huddled round them. Crewmen sat in anguish, waiting, chafing for our return. We beached our vessel hard ashore on the sand. We swung out in frothing surf ourselves, and herding Cyclops' sheep from our deep holes, we shared them round so no one, not on my account, would go deprived of his fair share of spoils. So there were several ships, and Odysseus finally gets back to his other men, and they put they share the sheep. They put some sheep on, you know, make them all even. 
and so everyone would share. But the splendid ram, as we meted out the flocks, my friends in arms made him my prize of honor, mine alone. And I slaughtered him on the beach and burnt his thighs to Cronus' mighty son, Zeus of the Thundercloud, who rules the world. So they're celebrating, and now they're on a different island. They've kind of gone to a different place. They're across the water. They're not on the Cyclops' island anymore. But my sacrifices failed to move the god. Zeus was still obsessed with plans to destroy my entire oar-swept fleet and loyal crew of comrades. Now all day long, till the sun went down, we sat and feasted on sides of meat and heavy wine. Then when the sun had set and night came on, we lay down and slept at the water's shelving edge. When young Dom, with her rose-red fingers shone once more, I roused the men straight away, ordering all crews to man the ships and cast off cables quickly. They swung aboard at once, they sat to the oars in rings, and in rhythm churned the water white with stroke on stroke. And from there we sailed on, glad to escape our death, yet sick at heart for the comrades we had lost.